talking to uh, a G Echo patient blood management meeting. I'm very happy to see that we've already got quite a number of people in the room, and I believe a lot more are coming. So a big welcome to everyone. Just as a reminder, Gastro Echo is a wonderful pro project hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with Project Echo uh, at the University of New Mexico. And these sessions are held every week on a Wednesday, uh, different sort of themes that are run over different times. So once every month to six weeks, we'll have a patient blood management session, for instance. And in the other weeks, there may be other things related to other gastroenterological themes. So today we've got 93 registrations. I'm sure many of the people will still come in from all around Sub-Saharan Africa and even beyond. Um, I can just mention some countries here. Apart from South Africa, we've got the Cameroon, Congo, Ghana, Ireland, Kenya, the Maldives. I think we should host it from there uh, at some stage, Chris, Karen, I think uh, Sounds like the place. If we can't, we'll take Mauritius because we've got people from there as well. Nigeria, Peru, wow. Rwanda, Sudan, Tanzania, the United Kingdom, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. So this is really, really exciting. And um, I just want to say that the chat box is available for any questions you may have. Please feel free to uh, put anything you want to ask our speakers there today or any other questions you've got, please put it in there. And without further ado, do I'd love to introduce two very special people that I've worked with for a long time, uh, for 12 years to be exact, when I was still in Bloemfontein. And this is Dr. Claire Barrett and Dr. Wayne Simmons. Uh, Dr. Barrett is a specialist physician. When I met her, she um, started was still a medical officer with some incredible experience in intensive care, which came, uh, came in super handy in our acute leukemia unit, because Claire was the one person that could resus anybody. So um, we were very happy to, to have her and eventually she loved medicine so much that she um, went on to specialize in internal medicine, became one of our lead researchers, and now the uh, deanery has grabbed her to take a lead in research, uh, a leading role in research in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of the Free State. But beyond that, Claire has got a passion for transfusion medicine and patient blood management. And uh, together we've worked um, on a lot of things with regards to transfusion medicine and Claire also designed one of the most successful ever um, seminars for students where we teach them about practical case-based transfusion management. So I'm very excited uh, that you are here today, Claire. It's really great. And Claire is going to talk to us about uh, iron deficiency in the elderly and don't underestimate that topic. It is so fascinating. It is unbelievable. So um, we're looking forward to hear your talk. And uh, on her side or by her side, we've got Dr. Wayne Simmons, who um, I also know from the same period. And Dr. Simmons also qualified first as a specialist physician. And after that, uh, as a, a gastroenterologist, it's also at the Faculty of Health Sciences in the Department of Medicine. Um, in the free state. And uh, what always um, sort of he really struck me about Wayne is how someone can be so knowledgeable and yet so humble. And he's just got an aura of, of humility uh, around him. And again, don't let that fool you. This is a man who knows what he does. Um, so we're very, very fortunate. And I'm going to hand over to, to Claire right now to start the first topic, and uh, then I believe Wayne will um, do the intermezzo with a case, and then Claire will, will close it all again at the end. So um, without further ado, Claire, welcome, and Wayne, big welcome. Please, you, you're welcome to share your screen and start.
play uh, you are unmuted hey Sorry, I was muted. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me this afternoon. Um, my name is Claire, and like um, Prof Lowe said, I'm a specialist physician and I work at the University of the Free State. The topic that we're going to discuss today is the importance of iron deficiency in geriatric patients, with a focus on the diagnosis and management. So in South Africa, the, the majority of the population are young, and we know that. However, a significant percentage of the population are older than 60. And this comprises about 5.3 million of the population. If I'd known that we were going to have so many people from all over Africa, I might have got some stats from the other countries, but bear with me as, as I go through the South African figures. So the number of elderly people in South Africa is really growing. From a population of 3.5 million in 2002 to 5.4 million in 2020, and we can see that the median age of the population is growing in all the different population groups. Um, the highest percentage of elderly per population is definitely noted in the Caucasian population group, but this is certainly going to change over time. What is interesting is that the annual growth amongst the elderly rose from 1.1% in the period 20. 2002-2003 to 3% in 2019 2020 which shows that the population of elderly people is really growing in our country. What's also interesting to note and what I found surprising is that the highest percentage of elderly population is in the Eastern Cape. Now to anemia. If you look at the worldwide prevalence of anemia, you'll note that while anemia predominantly affects women and children, the elderly are certainly not spared, and the prevalence of anemia in that group is almost 24%. In South Africa, the general prevalence of anemia in the adult population is 17.5%, and obviously there are different references which speak to different percentages. Um, women are mainly affected, with 22% of women affected and 12% of male patients that are adults that are anemic. But what you'll notice is that there's a gender flip in the older population group, where a quarter of men are anemic and 13% of women are anemic in the age group older than 65. So this is just short of a two to one ratio, very much male predominant. And we often focus on these tea and toast tannies, as we call them, or tea and toast grannies. But perhaps we need to think about the Papan Malk men as well in the older population group, and that these, these are certainly people that are anemic and need to be looked at. The gender flip is not unique to South Africa. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey showed a similar finding, where the prevalence of anemia is higher in men than in women in the population group 65 to, to old, or older than 65. And you'll definitely notice that, um, that the prevalence is much higher in the group 85 and older and definitely um, more in men than in women. So when you think of anemia, I want you to think of Carl Fredrickson from the movie Up, which is one of my favorite movies. These are the anemic patients, older men, obviously women as well, but for, uh, my, my first sort of gear shift is that we must forget about, not forget about, but remember that men in this age group are definitely anemic as well. So what's all the fuss about anemia? Anemia in the elderly is associated with physical impairment, with reduced muscle strength. It's associated with frailty, falls and fractures, longer hospitalization, cognitive decline, depression, post-operative risk, coronary artery, artery disease, heart failure, and then mortality as well. So it definitely paints quite a dismal picture. So why is anemia or iron deficiency anemia specifically in the elderly? What's the fuss about that? We know that iron deficiency is the most common form of malnutrition in the world, and I'm sure that Vernon has told you lots about that in previous lectures. And we also know that at least 75, 75 enzymes and proteins rely on iron for their function. So we all always remember hemoglobin and myoglobin, 
But don't forget about DNA synthesis, mitochondrial function, the powerhouse of the cell, thyroid function, metabolic reactions, and then also the cytochrome P450 enzyme system, which is dependent on iron. So why do the elderly get anemia? The first reason is that they get sarcopenia. So we know that sarcopenia is associated with impaired glucose, amino acid, and iron metabolism. And this can certainly then lead to anemia. Older people have got a dysregulated inflammatory response. So this causes malabsorption and dysregulation of iron metab metabolism and absorption. Blunting of hypoxia and erythropoietin sensitive mechanisms. This is also associated with arterial stiffness as people get older. This mechanism becomes weaker and poorer. Both quantitative as well as qualitative alterations in stem cell physiology. And I learned a beautiful new word called eryptosis, which is apoptosis of red blood cells that happens at a sort of a younger age. These cells die in the elderly. Decrease in sex steroids, as well as frequent comorbid medical conditions, and then polypharmacy as well. If we look at the elderly who are anemic, you can divide them into three main groups. The first group is anemia that is associated with chronic diseases. And I don't mean anemia of chronic disease. I mean other associated chronic diseases. Of that, 63% is anemia of chronic disease. But other chronic conditions also make up that group. And the biggest other chunk is chronic kidney disease. A third of patients that are elderly who have anemia will have unexplained anemia. And then the other third will have nutrient deficiencies. Those nutrient deficiencies are predominantly iron deficiency, but one should not forget about B12 and folate deficiencies, as well as other nutrient deficiencies that can cause anemia in this population group. So why do these elderly patients get iron deficiency specifically? Older people are prone to malnutrition. They have a monotonous diet, especially institutionalized older people are more prone to getting iron deficiency. They've got a reduced appetite, diminished sense of taste, so they don't feel like their food so much. They've got delayed gastric emptying, reduced absorption, and decline in biologic and cognitive functions. They might have occult blood loss and blood loss that is completely missed, as well as obviously their concomitant chronic diseases, as well as inflammatory conditions. And then I put this little picture where Carl is just missing his Ellie. And I think that a lot of older people live alone and there's just no want to make an exciting meal if you just live all by yourself. Other causes of iron deficiency in older adults, chronic kidney disease we know reduces intestinal absorption of iron. This is a chronic inflammatory state. And then also other chronic infl inflammations like cancer as well as obesity. Heart failure is associated with iron deficiency, also because of this chronic inflammation, associated anorexia, the edema of the GI mucosa, decreased gastric motility, intestinal motility, poor mesenteric blood flow, as well as frequent hospitalizations and blood tests causing iatrogenic anemia and certainly iron loss as well. Gastrointestinal causes are common. These patients might have occult blood loss, which might be related to medications that they're taking, malignant as well as benign lesions, and then malabsorption as a result of helicobacter pylori, celiac disease, patients who've get, had gastrectomies or parasitic infections like Giardia, also inflammatory bowel disease. And here I just want to sort of emphasize that there are so many reasons why an elderly patient might have iron deficiency anemia, but don't think that they just need to have one. This study showed that up to 59% of patients who had iron deficiency anemia actually had a secondary cause also to have anemia. So one shouldn't just sort of put your pen down once you find the first cause. That you need to, with an older patient, you need to think a little bit harder that this is a cause, but are there not perhaps other causes that are contributing to the anemia in this older patient? The other group of patients that I just want to draw our attention to 
is the non-anemic iron deficiency patients. So this is a study that was performed in the UK where they took about four and a half thousand older patients. These were not geriatric per se, they, they were just older than 50. These patients all had normal hemoglobin, so either 12 or 13, depending on whether they were men or women. They were followed up for 14 years. The prevalence of non-anemic iron deficiency was 8.8% in the cohort, with more women than men affected. But what was interesting, there was that non-anemic iron deficiency was associated with a 1.58% increase in mortality in this cohort. So even without anemia, iron deficiency is important and is a risk per se for increased mortality, suggesting that non-anemic iron deficiency is probably a disease entity in its own right. So I'm sure that we've all seen this table and uh, you know, at various stages of our medical training. But there's some important elements to consider when we interpret ferritin in the older population. So ferritin increases with age, as well as with obesity and other chronic inflammatory states. So I want us to just take the message home that we should interpret a normal ferritin with caution in the older population. So perhaps we can use soluble transferrin receptor to help. And we know that with iron deficiency anemia, we expect the soluble transferrin receptor to be increased. But we must also remember that there are other causes that can also cause our soluble transferrin receptor to increase. So obviously iron deficiency anemia is one of them. Hemolytic anemia, serous hyptosis, sickle cell anemia, and thalassemia all can also then give a not a falsely elevated, but they also elevate soluble transferrin receptor. But what's also important and probably equally important is other things that cause the soluble transferrin receptor to be low. So we expect a soluble transferrin receptor to be normal or low in, the, in association with normal iron stores. However, patients with chronic kidney disease, or perhaps those have been hypertransfused or have had intensive chemotherapy could give you a normal or a low soluble transferrin receptor, which could mask iron deficiency. So practically, what am I saying? I, I, I quite like this approach where we add the um, biomark of CRP in the elderly population. So we can say that if you've got a ferritin of 30 to 300 with a normal transferrin saturation, we can, I think it's safe to assume that we've got a normal iron store. If the ferritin is less than 30, I think we can all agree that that is absolute iron deficiency. But if the ferritin is between 30 to 100 and the transferrin saturation is less than 20, or you've got a CRP that's more than five, in the older, elderly population, you can call that iron deficiency as well. If you've got a ferritin of more than 100 and a transferrin saturation of less than 20, or you've got a raised CRP, then that would fall into that spectrum of functional iron deficiency or anemia of chronic disease. So again, think of Carl and things that go up in, in, in the aging population, we expect our ferritin to be higher. So our cutoff is not going to be our normal lab reference. And even if we take the higher reference that we've accepted as 30, that's still not, it's still gonna miss iron deficient and um, elderly patients. So practically any hemoglobin in the presence of a ferritin below the lower level of normal or less than 100 in the presence of infection or inflammation should be investigated as iron deficiency anemia. All patients with iron deficiency anemia should have a celiac screen and urine analysis regardless of their age and gender. And gastroscopy, colonoscopy should be performed within two weeks of the elderly in the elderly with new iron deficiency anemia. So this is just a, um, a, a just a sort of a note to self of what, what we need to do. And I think what I'm just going to take out that's important here is that gastro, gastrointestinal investigations should be performed for all elderly patients with iron deficiency anemia, unless there's a history of significant overt non-gastrointestinal blood loss. We need to take a thorough history, including a drug and operative history and examination. There's no role for fecal occult blood testing in this group. And perhaps that, that's something that other people might disagree with. 
um, gastroscopy should be performed to exclude celiac disease, helicobacter pylori and atrophic gastritis. And then importantly, only in the presence of advanced gastric cancer or celiac disease, should we defer lower gastrointestinal investigation? If a patient has got a significant family history of colorectal cancer, colonoscopy should be performed even if this patient has got celiac disease. There are special cases. The patients that are post-gastrectomy definitely need to have um, gastroscopy if they've got an increased risk of gastric carcinoma. What's also important is patients who are on warfarin and aspirin, we should not attribute iron deficiency to these drugs. Although these drugs might increase the bleeding risk, we should treat these patients as one would treat any other patient and investigate them according to any other elderly patient's sort of algorithms. This is the same for proton pump inhibitors. Those patients should be treated like regular patients. And we should not just ascribe iron deficiency to uh, any one of these three drugs. Importantly, endoscopy is recommended for iron deficiency, even in the absence of anemia in the elderly population group. And then just to consider other causes for iron deficiency, if you don't come right, so idiopathic pulmonary um, hemosiderosis or urinary hemosiderosis. So don't the elderly patients have enough reason to have iron deficiency? So my question to Wayne is, while you can, can try and find the cause of iron deficiency, must, must you in the elderly. So do I, what, what does he say? If I've done all these investigations and nothing is, comes back positive and this patient is still iron deficient, should I test this patient further or do I give a trial of iron? Thanks, Wayne. Uh, thank you very much, Claire, and uh, thank you to G Echo and um, on the invitation uh, to, to, to speak at this platform. Um, and thanks to Professor Lowe for his introduction. Um, so uh, when I was uh, asked to contribute uh, a patient to this discussion, I, I tried to look for some images to depict um, the impression I got of the patient when I saw her for the first time. And I happened upon this picture, which is from a Dutch painter who's a pupil of Rembrandt, uh, and he painted this in 1652, and he called it the dozing uh, lady. So, and he had the habit of painting people who had nodded off to sleep. And if you look at these paintings, they are all uh, paintings of people who uh, are pale. And I wondered about iron deficiency in that era as well, um, and how uh, patients who were tired and fatigued and uh, potentially iron deficient were managed, if at all. So in this discussion of my patient, I'm going to just focus on six areas. So we'll present the patient, we'll look at obscure GIT bleeding. Uh, Claire has alluded to other causes for iron deficiency in the elderly, so I'll touch on a bit of that as well. I'll look at the endoscopic approach to iron deficiency in the elderly. And then in using the ASGE summary for endoscopy in the elderly, I'll just touch on some important points that, that we look at in patients, elderly patients that come for endoscopy in the evaluation of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. Then we'll get back to the patient and then back to Claire for further discussion regarding this. So this, the patient was a 67 year old female um, who was a pensioner and was referred with iron deficiency anemia. Um, she was known with obesity and hypertension, and she presented with initially with fatigue and swelling of her feet. On inspection, she was found to be pale. Uh, she denied hematemesis, medina, or red blood rectum, and she had a history of, of blood transfusion, uh, presumably for, for symptomatic anemia. On reports of endoscopy in 2019, um, she had an upper endoscopy. Uh, which showed the antral gastropathy. Her helicobacter testing then was positive. Uh, she had a lower endoscopy, which was normal, documented to the cecum, and she was treated with helicobacter pylori eradication, given iron replacement therapy, and then advised to follow up symptomatically and in terms of her iron status. 
She was referred to us with similar symptomatology at the beginning of this year. She admitted to not following up in 2020 due to the COVID-19 restrictions. She was again pale and admitted to fatigue again, this time with restless legs and chronic abdominal pain. Um, on further inquiry, her diet was, was healthy with active inclusion of iron-containing foods, and she was on enalapril and aspirin chronically. Her hemoglobin at time of seeing her was 10.6, so she was anemic. Microcytosis, she had a white cell count of 9, platelet of 380. Her ferritin was 19. Transfer and saturation was normal at 3, with a saturation of 10. Um, iron was 7.3. We did an IgA level as well as an anti-TTG to for serology for celiac disease, which was negative. Her thyroid, liver, and renal parameters were normal. She had had an ultrasound which showed a fatty liver and then a bowel wall thickening in the left colon. And then CT imaging um, reported that to be normal, but confirmed that patomegaly. The referring doctor had also done a Meckel scan, uh, which was negative for a diverticulum. So I did the relook endoscopy on her, and uh, on the upper endoscopy, she had reflux esophagitis uh, with a normal antrum, and um, uh, HP fast or helicobacter pylori testing at this stage was negative. I took biopsies in the antrum and in D2. Uh, I did a colonoscopy up to the terminal ileum, and I did biopsies series throughout there, and um, histology there, uh, unrewardingly said no pathologic diagnosis. And so we went on to consider small bowel and further obscure causes for, for her blood loss. So the, the, this is capsule endoscopy, which we, we do as the next step in the care of these patients. And literally the patient will swallow a, a little camera, a little pill that, that has a camera contained in it, as we see here, uh, swallowed this particular model um, has the cameras, four cameras at the, the, the center of the capsule device and not at the ends. And it, it, these four cameras are able to then take circumferentially um, images of the, the, the lumen or the gut that it, it traverses through. Um, other devices have capturing uh, uh, equipment that the patient wears and by Bluetooth, uh, this uh, information is able to be, to be picked up. Uh, this capsule, particularly the capsule cam, uh, the patient passes the capsule and then retrieves the capsule and the device is then placed into a receptacle which reads the data. So this is a picture of the patient's, this very patient's um, a summary. So what it does is it takes the images from these four uh, cameras, stitches them together, and you get a panoramic view of the entire circumference of that portion of bowel. And um, it takes thousands of images. I think this one was in the region of 8,500. And at this sort of scale here at the bottom, um, you see that it stitches them together and you are able to screen through at a much quicker pace and see where the red areas are, the suspicious areas, and then zoom in, in on those. So just some excerpts from this patient's uh, capsule endoscopy images. So the tongue, uh, the, the start of the stomach, um, then that's gastric mucosa as well. Then we're into the small bowel and then up top right into the small bowel again, terminal ileum into the cecum. Then there's colon, further colon. And then the patient is responsible for, for, for capturing this device again in the toilet. And we often get an image of the patient doing that. Um, the unfortunate thing here, though, is that the patient's capsule endoscopy was completely normal, and on screening through numerous times, there was not a clear-cut cause for bleeding in this patient. Uh, just some limitations of capsule endoscopy. So you cannot provide therapy or do any intervention with the capsule. You, you, you can have an idea of where the location of the, the, the lesion is, but the precise location is not very accurate. Uh, the capsule retention may be a problem, especially in patients with stricture, and we have something called a patency capsule, dissolvable capsule that can help in this scenario. So if we look at this scenario now where patients are undergoing investigation and um, iron deficiency for iron deficiency anemia, this was a study in Turkey where they looked at 130 
1,388 elderly patients, uh, anemic with uh, associated low ferritin, less than 15 in males and less than nine in females. Um, of that, 25% of them had anemia. And of that number, 30.5% uh, of them who had iron deficiency. Uh, this group uh, was, 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 endoscopy was done in this group and it was 96 endoscopies of which 55 patients uh, showed uh, lesions in the upper GI tract, um, uh, for 26 in the lower, but no cause was found in 15 patients. Uh, there were malignancies, 15 of them, eight in the colon, eight, six in the gastric mucosa, and ga gastric setting, and one esophageal. So it remains then a problem in this group of 15, you know, and we call this obscure gastrointestinal bleeding or what is currently known as small bowel bleeding, which is a narrower term for this suspected bleeding in the small bowel. And this is defined by gastrointestinal bleeding of uncertain cause after a non-diagnostic upper endoscopy, colonoscopy, and small bowel evaluation. It is overt if there's visible acute bleeding, um, often with exsanguination and a patient who is unstable, um, where, where, where blood is visible, and then it can be occult, which is what we see at medical gastroenterology more frequently, where there's no visible bleeding, usually in association with iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia. The culprit lesion in these scenarios is not recognized initially as a bleeding site. It's difficult to visualize with normal endoscopy. And in the small bowel, it remains then beyond the reach of the standard endoscopes and then requires this extra evaluation to look at the small bowel. Just some causes of, of, of obscure GI bleeding or small bowel bleeding. So in the elderly, especially angioectasia, these are aberrant blood vessels that develop with advancing age. A majority of them are in the larger diameter parts of the colon. Um, histology shows ectasia, and that's why they are called angioectasia, not dysplasia. Um, and they can cause uh, frequent bleeding in patients, which um, uh, is resulting in, in iron deficiency. Um, there's um, associated conditions, and, and the condition that is often interesting is the link with aortic stenosis, that's Hades syndrome. And uh, we see a lot of elderly patients with aortic stenosis, and this combination then this should be considered when they present with iron deficiency anemia. Therapy is done with argon plasma coagulation or any thermal method to, to coagulate these lesions. You can inject them, you can ligate them with bands. And then for those that have diffuse involvement, um, you can manage them medically with um, anti-growth uh, substances like thalidomide, estrogens for bleeding, iron replacement, and then in this case particularly to avoid antithrombotic agents in them where possible. Other things that we can see, Cameron's lesions, uh, lesions that we see often in relation to a hiatus hernia, where the diaphragmatic pinch happens and causes ulceration there. Crohn's disease, typically in the small bowel, uh, a problem causing iron deficiency. Never underestimate NSAID use in the elderly for a number of indications, but deleterious then in the GI tract. Dulafoy's lesions can be seen in the small bowel, which are a larger arterioles that, that do not branch. Um, so these are larger caliber vessels in, in this, the mucosa that then have a risk of bleeding. The evasive um, um, pancre pancreatico biliary disease, so hemosuccus pancreaticus, um, where you don't see bleeding in the fasting patient when doing endoscopy uh, and ERCP. Uh, Meckel's diverticulum remnants of or gastric mucosa in the lower in a small bowel that can bleed, you know, if ulcerated. And then diverticulosis does not only affect the colon, but can also affect the small bowel um, and lead to bleeding there as it would in the colon. Malignancies in the small bowel are not unheard of. So leiomyomas, neuroendocrine tumors can affect the small bowel, lymphoma, and adenocarcinoma. <clears throat> so looking at Endoscopy is fine, but one should always remember that if the endoscopy, and in this case, the, the, the capsule endoscopy evaluation of the small bowel is normal, one should consider the other causes that Claire has already alluded to, 
um, like dietary insufficiency, deprivation. Um, I'll make a note to change tea and toast studies to, to include men as well in the elderly. Um, poor fitting dentures, malabsorption, previous gastric surgery, helicobacter pylori because of ulceration, as well as because achlorhydric state that they can cause, um, achlorhydria for other reasons, parasitic worm infestations, excess iron requirements like those patients that are getting EPO, and then postmenopausal bleeding. So a number of uh, things to consider in the elderly as well. So the approach to these patients with Iron deficiency should, should mirror that as any other patient, and we, should, we do endoscopy on them. If the endoscopy proves to be normal, it's worthwhile to give them iron replacement, appropriate iron replacement, and then follow them up. And if their HP is maintained, it is usually not necessary to go further if they continue. And I think to follow them up three monthly for a year is a good plan, and then for further year thereafter, and then only investigate further if there's a drop despite this, this route. If a patient, however, remains obscure in terms of their bleeding and they do not respond to, 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 to iron replacement therapy, it's then paramount to, to investigate them further and do the capsule endoscopy, repeat, have relook endoscopy, and then where any cause is found to treat that. We do, unfortunately, now, like in my patient's case, have the scenario where the capsule endoscopy is done and we still don't have a reason for the patients. And in most of these algorithms, of which there are many, you end up to the point where you, you want to consider things and, and, and you, you do these things and then in the end it's observe where nothing. And I think it's an important point that in the elderly especially, time is often a test and certain clinical scenarios show up with time. So in the elderly, we, I'd like to think we do have that time as well, and we should offer this to patients and see them. And I think it's the place for meticulous and dedicated follow-up in this group. We can investigate further then if we do find a lesion in the small bowel, and we can do deep endoscopy to, to locate the lesions, and a number of endoscopic devices um, can be used. So in our center, we, we have a double balloon enteroscope, which literally has two balloons with an overtube that threads the entire small bowel onto it. And, and that allows us to access uh, the lesions or the cause of bleeding. You do get fancier devices like spiral enteroscopy, which can forward and backward and spirals the whole small bowel onto the scope. And then ultimately and invasively, if you don't find the cause, one can do intraoperative enteroscopy as well. Um, in patients where endoscopically you do not find a lesion, you can do imaging, and it, this is suggested to have cross-sectional imaging on all patients with, with, with uh, obscure um, iron loss or iron deficiency an anemia. Um, there's a number of modalities available, but the important thing to remember is that these modalities to yield an answer need a certain rate of flow. Um, so if you have a very slow lesion, a bleeding lesion, uh, that would then lead to iron deficiency, the yield is, is often low with these modalities. So I'm going to touch on a few points in the elderly and using the recommendations from the ASGE. Um, if we look at the elderly patient, we should evaluate their baseline functional status, their cognitive ability, and their capacity to understand the procedure. I think this appreciation of a patient's baseline would have us not to subject patients to the idea that age is a reason or a relative contraindication uh, for endoscopy and invasive investigation. And I think we, we've touched on this already in this discussion. Uh, standard monitoring procedures in the elderly, one has to be meticulous about monitoring. Their response to sedation might be altered with impairment of liver and renal function. Um, one should make sure to use lower initial doses of sedatives in them and be cautious as you up titrate um, to effect. Bowel preparation is, is, a, is a tricky one. Um, you know, to, to get a good yield from endoscopy, you have to get good bowel preparation. And in the elderly, balanced electrolyte agents are suggested. Um, polyethylene glycol is an example. And uh, to put, avoid potentially harmful fluid and electrolyte shifts in this population, particularly the phosphate containing um, agents can lead to hypophosphatemia, for example. 
the goal is to get the best bowel prep that you can as possible. And the suggested method uh, of late is the split dose preparation, where you divide your bowel prep into two doses. We use two liters in the afternoon, the day before the procedure, and uh, two liters in the morning before the procedure. If you have a, a, a midday to late procedure, and if it's an early morning procedure, you split these two doses the day before, um, supporting the patient that's elderly in terms of the fluid status. And often this requires an admission, a day admission uh, for nursing care, observation, and intravenous support uh, where necessary. Um, colonoscopy in the elderly, issues of diverticulosis and so on. One has to be very cautious in this population group. These patients are having a higher risk of adverse events during colonoscopy. Uh, but that said, um, screening colonoscopy and evaluation for iron deficiency anemia should not be um, sort of contraindicated in these patients on account of their age. And I think um, it, it, the pragmatic look has to be taken as well. And one is to individualize how invasive you're going to be in a patient based on their general health, uh, their comorbid illnesses, as well as the patient and their family and their requirements and expectations of what we're going to do. Uh, so I think those points are, are crucial. Uh, they also talk about um, capsule endoscopy in the elderly, and, and this is seen as a safe procedure with few reported adverse events. There was a concern about the interaction with defibrillators and pacemakers, and there haven't been this hasn't been shown uh, to be to be the case. Um, effects of aging on capsule endoscopy and rates of completion of small bowel evaluation. It seems that evaluation is, is similar in all age groups, and there's no decreased uh, evaluation or, or visualization in the elderly. And then we do see a higher number of pathological findings, particularly angioctasia and malignancies in this uh, age group of people. So those are just some points on endoscopy in the elderly um, and in the elderly with iron deficiency, anemia, which is often obscure in terms of finding the cause. And then back to our patient where we, we decided to give her an intravenous dose of Cosmofa to, 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 to bypass in a sense the, the, the absorption and as a test. So we will see her in some time and see if she's, she's maintained on the intravenous dose. We've re-emphasized to her the dietary measures, including vitamin C. Um, we've advised her to stop her aspirin. So the discussion about antithrombotic agents in patients with iron deficiency anemia is, is a much longer discussion, I think. But in this case, we've advised her to stop aspirin and we'll follow her up in six to eight weeks to review her iron status and review her clinically and hopefully she's better for it. And if not, we'll have to go forward with, with further investigations and redoing certain things to try and, and, and reassess and, and go further in the evaluation of iron deficiency in this patient. So with that, I'll hand back to Claire to conclude. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Wayne. I like presenting with you. <laughs> so what I want to now talk about is, is how, what sort of considerations do we need to take when we decide to treat the elderly patient with iron deficiency? So I quite like the title of this editorial, it sort of tickled my love for hematology, the pale evidence for treatment of iron deficiency anemia in older people. And it, it just talks about the, sort of the lack of evidence and, and how we, sorry, um, and, and just the, that it's really difficult to, to make decisions based on low evidence in this um, population group. So what we can say and what we know is that we've got two options. We've got oral and we've got intravenous. And I suppose we do have other parental sources as well, but let's not talk about those right now. So in when we consider giving oral iron therapy, we know that intolerance to oral iron is a, is a problem generally in, in patients, but especially in the elderly, especially when they struggle with um, gastrointestinal symptoms and side effects, and specifically constipation in this group is a big problem. The other is the other comorbidities that affect the absorption of, of iron. So then maybe the new kid or not 
a new kid on the block with suprasomial iron. And is this really the next best thing? So we know that this iron um, absorbs paracellularly. It's, it's not dependent or affected by hepcidin. So it should be really a good option in, in older patients. However, um, in the study that I read, although the gastrointestinal side effects were very, very low when using suprasomial iron, the population group that did, so 27% of patients had um, adverse events related to suprasomial iron, which, which is relatively low. However, all the adverse events that were reported were all in the older population group. So in the older population group, 85.7% of patients had adverse gastrointestinal events related to suprasomial iron. So perhaps one must just be careful before sort of declaring it's a cure-all and, and the best option for all patients. Certainly in the younger population, sucrosomial iron really does look like a, like a promising option. Intravenous iron then in the elder population is great, except it does cost more. Sometimes infusion space is a problem, hospital beds are a problem, some um, some of us don't have a place in our rooms to give um, infusions in, you know, not in the hospital setting. Obviously, we've got fewer adverse events now with the larger molecules. And the other great advantage of intravenous iron is that we can give a total dose infusion. What's the optimal dose of oral iron in older patients? So I'm assuming we already know that alternate day seems better than daily dosing. But the next thing is is in older patients, the efficacy of 15 milligrams versus 50 milligrams versus 150 milligrams of elemental iron had exactly the same efficacy in terms of both ferritin and rise in hemoglobin. And I've, I think that that's quite interesting. So as, as much as we only need to give alternate days, we can also give a really low dose alternate days. And then the tolerability obviously was much better with a lower dose. So that being said, I think that it's, a, it's pretty much a no-brainer that we should give a low dose um, of, of iron every alternate day. But then what about when oral iron isn't the best idea? So I've suddenly thought about what about if, you know, the, what iron does to the absorption of other drugs? And I found this old article, it's published in 1991, where it talks about iron supplements, a common cause of drug interactions. And it seems like iron interferes with other, other drugs, either by binding to them in the um, gastrointestinal lumen or else in activating the drugs in that space. So if we think about our geriatric population, many of our patients are on multiple drugs. And I think that we must just take note that iron can bind to those drugs, decreasing the efficacy of those drugs. So bisphosphonates, definitely are affected by um, oral iron. Drugs to treat Parkinson's are affected, thyroid hormone. So actually almost all the thyroid supplement um, agents are affected by oral iron. And then with the aging population of HIV positive patients, we must remember integrase inhibitors and then also immunosuppressants. There are some antibiotics that are also affected. And I think with those ones, it would be fine. One can just, you know, not give the iron while those patients are on those drugs. But while the, for these long and chronic medications, I think one would have to be careful. The other thing is that one can take both of the drugs at the same time, you know, leaving two hours after taking the drug and then only taking your iron. But we also know that complex drug regimens are complicated for older population, especially if they're nursing homes and they sort of get given a handful of drugs and get told to take them. So this is something that we need to consider. Also, just sort of aside, we must, so many patients are taking multivitamins that are iron containing, and it makes me wonder how many of those iron containing multivitamins are affecting the efficacy of, of the bisphosphonates, for instance. So the last point is the pill burden. Do we want to add another pill to these patients? More than 60% of geriatric patients are already on three pills a day. Almost 40 are taking five a day. And if you're in a nursing home, you're averaging six to eight pills a day. So we, I mean, there's, there's conflicting data on whether reducing the pull burden improves um, compliance, but it's definitely something to consider. 
So administration of intravenous iron in the elderly patients, I think as a general message, I'd say that we must have a low threshold for intravenous iron. But it is a gray area. Not all elderly patients are automatically eligible for intravenous iron. But there are certain cases where we've got strong indications for intravenous iron. So that's things that we know, chronic kidney disease, stage five on dialysis, inflammatory bowel disease with active disease, any malabsorption, patients with heart failure, hemoglobin less than eight, iron resistant, iron deficiency anemia, iron deficiency anemia with intolerance to oral iron. And then also I put in there, what, what about important drug interactions? Suggested, so stage three to five already on dialysis, those patients also suggested to be on intravenous iron. And then importantly, there's no indication for intravenous iron for non-anemic iron deficiency. And then just a note uh, is that once a patient has had their single dose of intravenous iron, I do think practically it's important to follow up the efficacy of the intravenous iron and also make sure where the follow-up doses aren't needed. Because often I think, you know, we see think to ourselves, this patient's head is iron and off we go. But in my experience, there are many patients that need follow-up, A, of the, of the cause, but older patients, I've got one older lady that I can think of specifically, where she doesn't want any further investigations, but she wants her iron because it makes her feel better. So we follow that up. This sort of warranted one slide, so bear with me, the role of iron in the treatment of anemia of chronic disease in the elderly. So given that a third of patients that are elderly with anemic have got other diseases causing their, iron, their anemia, and a lot of that, the big chunk of that is anemia of chronic disease, I just thought that I'd mention this. So obviously the, the, the main thing is to treat the underlying condition. The second thing is to give iron only to maintain the transferrin saturation at more than 20% and the ferritin to more than 100. And there's no role for iron if this patient is iron repeats. Obviously there are other drugs like EPO, transfusion and other emerging therapies that we won't talk about now. So when does iron not work? Obviously if the patient's not compliant, if there are other absorption problems, Blood loss exceeds the intake. I've got an incorrect initial diagnosis or which is very relevant in the elderly patient that I've got more than one diagnosis. I've got an inflammatory state that just won't let my iron work or the therapy was effective, but this patient's bleeding has recurred. So I hope you're not feeling too dismal after this. And I really want to thank you for your attention and for inviting me to speak to you today. Wayne and Claire, thank you so very much for such a thought-provoking set of presentations. Um, I've, I mean, I, I'm really passionate about iron and I've learned quite a few things from you guys today. So uh, thank you very much. Um, can I just, uh, I'm going to just remind everybody to please ask uh, any questions you have, you can ask in the chat box. But I'm going to start off with the... Um, with Claire's comment on fecal um, occult blood loss testing. You, 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 you said some people may, may differ from you, and, and I think you, you're probably right, because I, I believe there are some, some amazing new things around. And can I ask maybe Wayne and Chris to just give your experience with some of the newer um, uh, FOB testing um, tests that are available and whether whether they have got a role to play. I'm very, very curious about that. Wayne? Um, sure. Yeah, so just generally fecal occult blood testing has been thought to not uh, be useful in the setting of iron deficiency anemia um, because it, it it's not very specific, um, you know, so uh, for historically that's what, what I understand. Um, the, the newer biomarkers, you know, that as far as I'm aware, can increase the, the, the specificity. But um, yeah, I, I'm not, I don't have experience of, of these newer um, agents or these newer tests. But uh, so that's my comment. Okay. So Vernon, I mean, in this, in this group of patients, 
uh, where you know, the majority uh, of patients will have organic pathology. You're not going to use any form of fecal alcohol blood testing as a stratifying marker. If it's positive, it might be helpful. If it's negative, it's not really that helpful either. So the point that Claire made is it's not, the, it's not what's gonna determine whether you investigate these patients or not. But a couple of points. Um, thank you very much, Wayne. Excellent overview. We've got the technique technology to look at the gastrointestinal tract from tongue to anus. I mean, that we've got. In the elderly, caution with regard to second looks. It is a principle amongst gastroenterologists that you do two sets of endoscopic evaluation, not necessarily capsule, but endoscopic evaluation before you declare this patient no cause for the, um, uh, for the occult uh, uh, loss. But Important also to appreciate that just because it arrives in a gastrointestinal uh, gastroenterologist's office doesn't mean that the course is either going to be from the is going to be from the gastrointestinal tract. And yes, we have the technology to look for celiac disease, but there are other causes of malabsorption of iron which are not celiac. And yes, it, it, it may be. Um, occult overt, that's clinically obvious, and you will find the cause, the cause if you do it at the time of GI bleeding. But we are looking at this very small group of patients who, who have obscure occult bleeding, and you may never find a cause. Two, two points. The first is that when, I'm start, when I start considering second look endoscopies, and in the elderly, a second look colonoscopy, not because of the procedure, but because of the bowel prep, it, you, it is very important to respect age when it comes to bowel pressure and pre prep and colonoscopy. Very often these patients are found at three o'clock in the morning, having had a vasovagal attack from the you know, cathartic experience that they had in the bathroom, collapsed on the floor. And we have had patients who fractured basal, uh, basal skulls uh, uh, in the bathroom at that, and at that time. So you've got to respect the age of the patient. Doing a second capsule is a different story. But when I'm considering looking again, I then pull back and I start going back to the full blood count and looking for a few hematological issues that may be uh, occurring at the same time. Is there a macrocytosis? Is there a hematological cause that can be very subtle? Is the patient hemolyzing? I look at bilirubin, I look at LDH. We, we see patients with vitamin B12 deficiency that don't have macrocytosis. So it, it, it important as gastroenterologists not just to focus on the gastrointestinal tract when you're not finding a cause. And I often call the hematologist. And at the time of the second look endoscopies, while they're sedated, I often include a bone marrow evaluation just to help the hemato hematologist. And one final point, H. pylori infection is very common in sub-Saharan Africans. We have a prevalence rate of about 70%. And yes, it is a consideration as a cause of iron deficiency in the absence of erosions and ulcerations, which is a very well regarded cause. It can cause atrophic gastritis, and it is known to drop, uh, to reduce vitamin C levels in gastric juices, and hence reduce the absorption of non-heme iron. So yes, Wayne, I think it was good that you eradicated H. pylori infection. Unfortunately, it didn't help as the cause. And, that, and then final point is, bring out a flow sheet very early on. The rate of change of that hemoglobin and drop in iron often dictates whether you're losing or not. I mean, if you drop two or three grams in a couple of months, that's, you know, it's going to manifest somewhere, surely. And perhaps, Vernon, you could explain or, you know, take this further. You know, are the, the, these, these uh, malabsorption syndromes of iron which are not celiac related? I mean, we have discussed them previously, and perhaps you can just... Um, you know, elaborate further. Sure. No, I just want to say first, thank you, uh, uh, Chris. That's a, a great gastro hematologist answer. Thank you for for that. And um, no, I'm 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 happy with with that perspective. In my personal practice, I don't do fecal. Just to come back to that point, I don't do fecal occult blood testing at all, because I always believe that you should still go and scope. So why put the patient through all these difficulties of taking it in? 
So um, I think that makes sense, even though there may be very good ones around, they're not perfect and you don't want to miss anything. So that's sort of the message I'm getting from you and from Claire and, and, and Wayne as well. So thank you for that, that useful perspective. Um, I just want to see here quickly, there's a question here from Caroline Stain. Uh, thank you so much, Claire and Wayne, for a very clear and thought-provoking presentation. I would just like to comment on the study in non-anemic iron deficiency that Claire mentioned. Firstly, it is int intriguing that the excess mortality was related to cancer and respiratory causes. Are these causes of iron deficiency or effects of iron deficiency? Secondly, does one automatically treat non-anemic iron deficiency in order to mitigate this excess mortality risk? It seems it is not straightforward. Disclaimer, I quickly looked at the article. Thanks for that, uh, Caroline. <laughs> uh, impressive uh, question that you've asked here. So let's start yeah, with the first yeah, part of this. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm so glad Caroline is uh, is uh, studying towards becoming a hematologist. Uh, uh, Caroline, you could just as well have gone for gastroenterology, it would appear from what I read here. So um, Claire and Wayne, what do you think? Um, they say, do you think the, the, the cancer and respiratory uh, causes that were seen were causes of iron deficiency or effects of iron deficiency? It's a nice question. Well, I see I mentioned the article. I probably have to punish myself by answering the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, Caroline, seeing you've read the article, I'm sure you can also see that they don't really discuss that much. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. I think that's a pretty mean question from a person's friend. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that with the cancer, we could probably say, I mean, and we're just assuming, aren't we, that, that maybe the cancer was the cause of the iron deficiency. But equally, cancer is, is inflammatory and could well affect absorption of iron. The respiratory causes are very interesting. And, and I think that I'd have to go and have a look at that in deeper detail um, and to be able to answer your question with any meaning. Um, whether treating the non-anemic iron deficiency actually mitigates those risks, I think actually relates to your first question, you know, is this cause or effect and yeah, so I can't, I don't have a clever answer for you, Caroline. Maybe Wayne does. Well, very interesting and intriguing question indeed. Um, uh, uh, one would probably have to look at the types of cancers uh, that they looked at and, and, and tease that down and see. They did probably not get a unique answer for all different cancers um, in terms of was it chicken or the egg type of infect and the same with the respiratory diseases. Um, and then in terms of a second question, you know, I would think depending on that, you know, the idea would be to treat iron deficiency uh, without anemia in those patients, uh, and and uh, that would have to be to be studied to see whether that mitigates the, that risk. So that's how I would answer that question. But uh, yeah, interesting. Thank you. I'm just going to. I know we we at the end of our session, but I thought just to be a little bit provocative, I'll share this article that I came across actually this week. So the question is very timely. Yes. Uh, as I say, if I say this week, it's actually yesterday, so I haven't had the time to read it. I just scrolled through it. But the fascinating thing about this article, um, which I'm sure will interest all of the gastroenterologists if you haven't read it yet, it's published on the 11th of March, which is just two weeks, three weeks ago. Uh, the flip side of the coin, iron deficiency in colorectal cancer, and it speaks about the role of iron in cancer biology and how... Um, the patients with iron deficiency where it could actually play a role in part in the pathogenesis, but also in the outcomes of patients and the way the immune system, the natural killer cells, et cetera, et cetera, are able to respond to small cancers or early cancer formation. So this is really interesting. It affects cancer epigenetics. We know that it affects epigenetics in um, the developing fetus, which predispose them to autism and schizophrenia and potentially other, other conditions. 
So really a fascinating, fascinating paper that I think um, you will all uh, enjoy. So it's from Frontiers in Immunology uh, by Aksan. And uh, yeah, maybe that could be an advertisement. And a topic perhaps, uh, Chris, for, the, for some future mm -hmm. meeting um, on iron and colorectal cancer. I think it brings the things so nicely together. I think we, we, we've, we're out of time. So, um, and I know other people have, um, have other places to go to. And I would just like to say in closing, first, again, thank you so, so much to our speakers. Brilliant talks. And Claire, I've taken a couple of screenshots from your um, presentation as well, specific to the elderly that I um, will ask your permission for in future to, to make use no. of. <laughs> Wayne, Wayne had me so dumbstruck, I, I was just in, there was too much news, so I just concentrated and listened to what you said, Wayne, so thank you very much. Love to see your presentations again. Unfortunately, this was recorded as well. So I want to say thank you um, also to Project ECHO, University of New Mexico. I want to say thank you to the ECHO India team, who's been helping with the technical aspects of this. Uh, please complete the feedback you'll see in the chat box there just appeared a little link that you can click on it's really really useful to get honest sincere feedback if there's something you didn't like i won't take it personally and i'm sure our speakers won't either um, or you know we, we want to make this the best it can be so please tell us what you like what you want more of and the recordings of these sessions are available also previous sessions on the Gastro Foundation website. Please go and uh, look at them there and share the advertisement of this meeting when it comes around. So as a heads up for next week, we've got a G Echo Pathology session. The facilitators will be uh, Professor, Professors Wendy Spearman and Mark Sunderup, which I'm sure the gastroenterology community know well. Uh, the histopathologist, uh, Professor Mike Lockets. Uh, so it's a UCT team next week. And they will speak on drug-induced liver injuries. Uh, something, uh, Chris, I saw yesterday. I actually uh, ran into a dress syndrome yesterday uh, on, on, on imat uh, imatinib on one of my CML patients. Mm. And uh, three clinical cases of Dili will be discussed as well. So please come, enjoy. Uh, come and support and thank you a special thank you to Chris Cassianides who's the big driver behind the screens Ka Karen Fenton without whom nothing will happen I'm sure uh, with all the logistics and administration and planning and so forth thank you very much and to all the people all of those sponsoring and supporting the G Echo uh, programs have a lovely evening and afternoon everyone um, with that I'm saying goodbye Thank you. Bye. Bye.